In 1967, several researchers in Europe began experiencing symptoms of a mysterious new disease. It was later identified as Marburg virus, a close cousin of Ebola, which researchers contracted after handling a consignment of African green monkeys from Uganda. This new disease was so contagious and deadly that CDC researchers invented a new laboratory with a higher level of biological containment to safely study it. This new maximum containment facility was mobile and built in the back of an 18-wheeler using air-sealed cabinets with glove inserts to conduct experiments in the CDC's parking lot. Only a few years later, the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, USAMRID, opened the first permanent maximum containment laboratory in Maryland. For a long time, there were only a few of these labs in the US and Europe. But more recently, they've been appearing all over the world, with even more planned since the COVID-19 pandemic. What's behind the rise of these maximum containment laboratories? And do we really need so many? Biosafety levels are essentially a series of increasing containment measures that you adopt to work safely with pathogens. My name is Dr. Philip Alensos. I'm a social scientist working at King's College London, focusing on biosecurity risks and how we can address them. There are four levels of biosafety, which were established back in the 1970s. Biosafety level one targets bacteria and viruses that are not associated with disease. So containment measures here are, are very basic and include things like washing hands, keeping surfaces clean, really just good hygiene. Your kitchen counter could function as a BSL-1 edge top. Level two is where you have bacteria and viruses that rarely cause disease and where therapeutics are often readily available. So here you would wear a lab coat, goggles, possibly gloves. There should be a sign on the door saying it's a BSL-2 lab. This could be a high school or undergraduate lab or, or even a dentist's office. It's when you get to biosafety level three that you have bacteria and viruses that cause serious disease. So for example, the pathogens that cause anthrax or TB or plague. At level three, you move from the lab coat and goggles to more robust personal protective gear. And you work within biosafety cabinets where the airflow is regulated. Also, all the air that comes out of the lab is filtered and all the effluent or the waste that comes out of the lab is decontaminated and filtered. You monitor access in and out of the lab, there are locks on the doors, and so on. Biosafety level four labs are maximum containment facilities where you work on bacteria and viruses that cause very serious disease and where therapeutics are not readily available. This is where you'd work with pathogens that cause Ebola or Marburg or the hemorrhagic fevers, for example. And this is where you'd have the most stringent containment measures. So you'd most likely wear a full body spacesuit, you'd have your sleeves taped down, you'd double glove, you'd shower before entering and exiting the lab. You'd have extensive training, you'd work in pairs. There are all kinds of protocols and standard operating procedures that are in place regulating your behavior. For a long time, there weren't very many of these labs. Before 1998, there were fewer than 10 BSL-4 labs mostly in the US and Europe. In 2023, there are 51 BSL-4 labs in operation around the world, with another 18 planned or under construction. That doesn't even include the 57 so-called BSL-3 plus labs that have adopted additional safety measures to place them somewhere in between BSL-3 and BSL-4. To understand what's behind this jump, we have to go back to the 1990s. In 1993, a Japanese doomsday cult released anthrax from a rooftop in Tokyo. A few years later, they orchestrated another attack involving sarin gas on the Tokyo subway. In the US, the anthrax letters further contributed to concern over bioterrorism. This is primarily responsible for the early uptick in high containment laboratories. But pretty soon, a new kind of threat would emerge. We saw the galloping rise of SAR, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. During the 2000s, there were several high-profile disease outbreaks, including SARS, MERS, swine flu, and Ebola. Those events created a sense of urgency to study pandemic-capable viruses, which led to even more labs being built, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of labs has again increased dramatically. So there are now many more labs being built, primarily to deal with the health threat from disease and disease outbreaks. 
According to Dr. Lensos, these labs basically have two functional purposes. Most BSL-4 labs are focused on public health. Much of what they do is diagnostics, clinical work, sample analysis. So for example, when you have a sick patient and it's not clear what they're suffering from, you take a sample, perhaps blood, saliva, urine, and you need to send that sample to a lab, a lab that can then analyze it and find out what bacteria or virus is causing the patient's illness. Some BSL-4 labs are also focused on research. So they're learning about the particular characteristics of pathogens, how they infect people or animals or plants, um, how they transmit between people, how they respond to therapeutics, how they then further evolve. And much of this research is really to build basic scientific knowledge about new and emerging pathogens. The knowledge building aspects of these labs are increasingly necessary for studying infectious diseases because we're likely to encounter them a lot more in the future. According to an article in the journal Nature, 58% of human pathogenic diseases could be worsened by climate change. In other words, COVID-19 likely won't be the last time the world faces a pandemic. And these labs are at the forefront of studying the spread and treatment of pandemic-capable diseases. So what's the problem? There are clear benefits to these labs. We need them to work safely with disease-causing biological agents. They're important facilitators of public health, of biomedical advances and disease prevention. But they also come with certain risks. There are a number of different risks that are associated with these labs. First and foremost are safety-related risks. So these are risks of the researcher accidentally infecting herself with a pathogen and causing disease possibly also infecting other lab workers, uh, family members, or even the wider community. There are also risks of inadvertent releases of bacteria and viruses from the lab into the community, which, again, could spark infection and possibly a disease outbreak. This is more common than one would expect. According to a 2022 article, between 1975 and 2016, there were more than 70 events of human-caused pathogen exposures in labs of all types of biosafety levels. In addition to the safety risks, there are also a series of security risks. Key risks here include pathogens or other related material being stolen from a lab and lab insiders using their knowledge and their skills and their access for malevolent purposes. There are also risks related to dual use, where scientific knowledge and methods used by lab workers to understand and manipulate pathogens for public health purposes is repurposed by others to cause harm. The examples mentioned earlier in this video, the Japanese doomsday cult and the anthrax letters, both of those featured university-trained experts working in labs on dangerous pathogens, Seiichi Endo and Bruce Ivins. Another aspect of dual use relates to national capacity building competition. Increasing the number of labs and the number of researchers that are working with dangerous pathogens in your country may contribute to a perception by other states that your capacities to weaponize biology are increasing. And this may provide justification for other countries to expand their biodefense programs or possibly even initiate an offensive program. According to the Global Biolabs Initiative, many of the countries building new labs, some for the first time, don't have adequate bio-risk management policies in place. The latest analysis shows that the labs are being built in places that don't have a history of building these labs. And importantly, many don't have adequate oversight systems in place to make sure that the work is being done safely, securely, and responsibly. There are recommended international standards that exist for bio-risk management, but adherence is voluntary, which means that bio-risk policies vary between countries. Well, at the international level, what we're seeing right now is that bio-risk management efforts are uncoordinated and fragmented. There's wide variation in levels of resources and attention that's being devoted to biosafety and to biosecurity and dual-use research oversight. And we're seeing very few legally binding requirements and even fewer mechanisms to ensure proper implementation and compliance. A delicate trade-off has emerged. Climate change is making it more likely that humanity will encounter new pandemic-capable viruses in the future and extensive scientific research will be needed to manage those risks. But without sound bio-risk management regulation, it's possible that our efforts to prevent pandemics could make the problem worse. With the rapidly increasing number of labs, we need to ask ourselves as a global community, at what point 
do the risks of building more and more labs outweigh the benefits that they provide?